This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, everybody. Hey, it's Alex. And this is the Rambo, and we go until midnight tonight from New York, New York. Hey, Bubs, how you doing? I'm on fire. <laughs> it really sounds it, you know. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on fire. <laughs> Literally, I'm burning. <laughs> You're just burning up, burning up the track. So anyway, uh, hey, listen, I forgot to ask you last week, uh, how's the hernia doing? The hernia was uh, it was okay yesterday. I'll find out how it goes today. It was uh, the other day. It was really, really hurt, hurting. So still waiting to get that date from Kaiser. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. They haven't gotten back to you on it? No, they said they would, and that was three weeks ago. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh well, you know. I mean, you got to get that taken care of because you complain about. I know. About it. I've put it off too long. Yeah. Even uh, our old friend Bob Rubin got his done. So. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Where's he living now? Up in Canada? Uh, he's still in L.A., but his girlfriend is in Canada, so I think he's up there. No, right his now. wife. His wife. His wife. Yes. That's They're married. Correct. Yeah. Right. Because I should call him. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years now. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. should. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, um, um, so um, yeah, so you're, you're you're you you want them to give you the hernia operation? How did how how did Ruben say his went? Was it a problem? His went. That's what really gave me the impetus to go on to this. He just breezed through it. No, it didn't sound like it was painful at all. And uh, he was. I talked to him the day after the surgery. He was just doing fine. You know, these are all guys I I grew up with in San Francisco, right? I was a little mm -hmm. older than the rest of you guys. Uh, but, you know, we never talked about this kind of stuff. You know, oh, so how's your hernia doing? <laughs> well, uh, that's because we were younger and things weren't falling apart. <laughs> yeah. How's your prostate doing? You know, <laughs> well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I had prostate cancer. I, I just got a new, a new cancer scare from a doctor. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. He gave me a test and, and found out that I had my blood work. There was some, there, I don't want to have to explain the whole thing, but there are two segments of blood, blood work. And, and one of them was high, all right? The other one was normal. The one that was normal is the one that you don't want to see get high because it could be the dangerous one. The other one, it could be any number of things. He said, including... So, some kind of an inflammation or something like that, you know. But he's, but I then look it up and see what it could be. It could be multiple myeloma, which is a a blood cancer. Okay. Yeah. So I um, um, he finally calls me today and says, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I want you to go see. Uh, he says there's a ten only a ten percent chance this could be anything. He said, but I, I want you to go for a con consult to a oncologist, a hematologist. So I made an appointment with them. But, you know, it could be multiple myeloma. I doubt if it is because I don't have any of the symptoms of it. The only symptom I have is my neuropathy, which I've had for the last, like, eight years or so. So I don't think I've got it. Um, you know, you get back pain, you get all kinds of things. Uh, so I don't think that's what it is, but I'm going to go for the consult. So now I have to sit around and worry about cancer again. You know? Oh, Jesus. That's, a, that, that's always a fun wait, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I read on this thing they can they can extend your life for five to ten years at least, okay, if you have it. And I'm thinking, well, I'm 83. <laughs> uh, another ten years? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm I'm fearing the next ten years anyway. Because yeah, I'm uh, really getting scared about that myself. Where your body starts falling apart, you know? I mean, I, I have the neuropathy, you know, and whatever. So, 
And I said to the doctor, I said, well, I don't think it's multiple myeloma because I don't have any of the symptoms. He says, well, you've got neuropathy. Well, that is maybe one of the symptoms, but it's, it's also a symptom of a lot of other things too, so as he knows. So anyway, so that's my latest cancer fear, you know. So I'm going to this doctor. And all these guys who deal with blood hematologists are oncologist hematologists. They're not just hematologists. They have to add on the oncology to make you especially frightened. Jesus. So this will be my second oncologist I've had to deal with in my lifetime. Uh, but they're, they're cancer specialists. I think that I have nothing, to tell you the truth. You know, and if I do, it's it's a, it's a smaller version of it. So, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, the only thing, you know, the only thing that bothers me about the, all of this and getting old and getting all these little things, is the way they. The, my mother used to have a term for it. It was a Yiddish term, "pachki around with you," uh, and that means they're 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 playing around with you. You know, they're they're poking you and they're whatever. And, and, and just the fact that I'm reading like all the various things you could go through for multiple myeloma, if, 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 even if it, it wouldn't be that, wouldn't be a full case of that, but even if I had to go through that, all the pills and the antibiotics and the this and the that, and oh, also if you're younger, they'll do a stem cell transplant. And, da, 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 da. and I'm going, Geez, do I want to spend the rest of my life with somebody poking me? You know. So, yeah, you know, it's yeah, just yeah, it, but that's it, it, it's one thing after another. It's really annoying. It, it, do you want to spend? You know, we'll give you another ten years of life. Thank you very much. But every one of those years will be excruciating. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, because we're going to be sticking you with needles and we're going to be plying you with drugs that make you loopy and uh, unable to uh, do certain things. I mean, maybe maybe you don't want to live that way, you know? And I'm a uh, guy who doesn't want to die, but I don't know if I want to live that way. A friend of mine, his brother did that. He was in his late 70s, and he'd been going through the chemo and stuff for years and poking, and at yeah. uh, one point he just said, that, that's it, I'm done, and he quietly died like two years later, so he didn't want to go through any more of it. Yeah. I'm just sick and tired of this, you know. Yeah. If if you're going to extend my life and you're going to make me miserable for all those years, go screw yourself. I don't need this, you know. So uh, I'm 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 very uh, uh I don't know. I'm just uh, I mean this worries me of course, but uh, I'm you know I I think that it'll it'll probably come to nothing, but. You know these doctors. They say, "Oh, we're sending her over to the cancer doctor," for but it's just for a consult. It's not, you know, to see if they feel it's anything serious. But he didn't want to take any chances. You know why? Because I might sue him. Right. Yeah. 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 Or my family might sue him because I'll probably be dead because he made the wrong decision. <laughs> and you won't get any money out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, but I mean, I just, I, I find this just amazing, you know, uh, I, it, life, uh, life at this age should be, it should be pleasant, it should be easy, I mean, Marjorie, my wife, excuse me, folks, if we're talking about depressing stuff again, but hey, this is Larry, what else can <laughs> I do? That's what I'm known for. <laughs> Marjorie, I've been counting, it goes to at least three doctors a week. Now, I don't know, if I see one doctor in a half a year, I'm lucky, but she goes three times a week. She's got this doctor, the pain doctor, the this doctor, the that doctor, the foot doctor, the, the, the nostril doctor, I don't know, all these different, and I'm going, geez, is this the way you want to spend the rest of your life? Yeah. You know, you're eight, she's almost 80 years old. Do you really want that? You know? So anyway. Ta-da. So I just remember when you were a kid, just the uh, physical pain didn't seem to end your life at all back then. <laughs> I'd like to go back to being 
I don't know. Well, I, I, I feel sorry for these kids. You know, you read about them all the time. They get some kind of, like, lousy, horrible disease when they're, like, five years old, and then they're going through another four years of one thing and another, and they've got stuff up their spine, and man, man, man. And then ultimately they're okay, but they've spent the first, like, four years or five, ten years of their lives in pain, you know, going through one thing after another after another. You hear about them surviving, but then you go, what are they going to be like for the rest of their life because of this experience? I mean, how, how would you have turned out? Would you have maybe been taking life a little more seriously or something like that? You know? I'm sure it would have changed your outlook on life, but I'm not sure which way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I, I you know, I, I uh, uh, but I, I just don't, I, I don't, you know, I also don't trust doctors, to be honest with you. You know, I only have one doctor I really trust and really like, and that's my urologist. And I always hated urologists, but this guy is just a gem, you know. I mean, he saved my life. He's the guy who decided I had prostate cancer and that I should get something done about it. You know, and then sent me to the best guy in America to do the work. So, I mean, I, I, and, and the guy is just a gem, you know. You just, he's a pleasure, and his office is a pleasure. I mean, it's really amazing, just amazing that I like him. I like a guy that sticks his finger up my ass. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a great urologist too. Maybe we're uh, maybe they're the best doctors. Who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, no. Actually, urologists usually are the worst. This is yeah. what I've been told. Because I every every uh, urologist I ever had, I hated, absolutely hated, uh, and they were all just weird. And I just never. I felt they were just trying to pad the bill. You know, things like that. And. Um, uh, so I've always hated them. So when I found one I really liked, I was amazed. And uh, I think it was either he or some other doctor I was dealing with, oh, my, 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 my primary care physician. I said, I've never found a urologist I like. I said, they're the weirdest people I've ever had to deal with. And he says, oh, yeah, they're known in the profession, the doctor profession as being the weirdest group of people who, in the profession. Really? The urologists wow. are just crazy. And I'm thinking, why are they crazy? And then I think, if I had to stick my finger up a butt five times a day, ten times a day, I think probably, oh, I probably would go crazy too. Yeah. You know? And yet to find a person who is really in love with what he does and is very caring about you is an amazing thing to find in that profession. Um. However, my guy is down to four days a week. He takes Wednesdays off. And I said, why are you taking Wednesdays off? And he said, he says, it's just not worth it anymore. He says, you know, you, you make so little in this profession. You, we think about doctors as making a fortune, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact is, chances are my doctor, if he's, he's lucky he makes 200000 a year. But, and a lot of people go, well, that's a lot of money. But, you know, considering what they had to go through to become a doctor and considering what they do, they're really vastly underpaid now. Because you, f you forget about it, your doctor to begin with, if, if he charges $100, Medicare is going to save 50 All right? And then Medicare is going to pay their share, and your supplemental is going to pay that share. And then you get 50 bucks instead of 100 and now you still have to have an office. You have to have a staff in that office. Uh, if you ever, you, you go to Kaiser, so you probably don't know this, but in an average doctor's office, just a primary physician, okay, like my primary care physician, he has his own office. He's got working the accounting, something like five people, having to, deal, cost a fortune. Having to deal with all the insurance companies. And he's only getting like 50 cents on the dollar from Medicare. 
And you're paying five people, probably all making at least 70000 a year? I mean, amazing. You know, and I, I just wonder how he even keeps his doors open. So a lot of what happens with these doctors is they go out and they become, uh, uh, they go to work for like, you know, Kaiser. Kaiser, yeah. Or an HMO of one sort or another. And I said to him, I said, have you thought about going to an HMO? And he said, well, I'm getting a little old for that. He said, but... You know, I know why a lot of people do it, because they pay you $200,000 a year, and you sit there and you see a bunch of people, and you don't have to pay your staff. You don't have to worry about anything. They take care of it. Yeah, you, you don't have to worry about getting sued. That's right. You know, so, I mean, uh, I, you're going to see private physicians become a real thing of the past, and that's terrible, because that was wonderful. When you had a doctor you really liked and you trusted, you know, and they also over medicate and they o o over uh, estimate. I mean, you know, they're going to send you out. This doctor is going to send me out for that consult because he doesn't want to get sued if it turns out that that ten percent of that I could get something horrible comes about that he's going to get sued. So if he sends mm -hmm. it out for a consult, now he's putting off the legal action to another guy. <laughs> you know. But uh, that's a problem. How do you like Kaiser, by the way? Uh, I like the doctors. The, the administration of Kaiser is uh, very bad, but uh, the doctors are actually pretty good. Now, why did you get Kaiser? Was it just that you decided you wanted that as your... It's it was just something I had from my day job, and I carried it over into, into when I quit and got into comedy, so I just had it forever, but... Yeah, because, the, you know, the thing about Kaiser, there's a, in case people don't know, we're talking about uh, Kaiser Hospital out in San Francisco. Uh, they, um, they were started by Henry J. Kaiser, who was an automaker, mm -hmm. had an automobile company. Don't know if anybody knows the Kaiser automobiles anymore. I've seen those, yes. Yeah. They're they, pretty cool. They, they had one called the Kaiser Darren that had lips on the front. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, Henry J. Kaiser was a very much a socialist and so he gave all his employees free medicine and to do that he built a hospital and so if you were if if you then went to uh, uh, if you belonged to Kaiser worked at uh, Kaiser's companies you could get free medical treatment and it was the and it was top-notch just top-notch so eventually, Kaiser spread this out to where he said, well, union members of unions can now be in on this. So that's when my parents got into it, because mm -hmm. my father was a member of the Musicians' Union. That qualified him to be a member of Kaiser. And Kaiser was really one of the first real experiments in socialized medicine. Uh, so it was a great organization. I mean, as a kid, I was brought up going to Kaiser when something was wrong or when I needed a checkup for something, and it was terrific. But over the years, it has suddenly it's become an HMO is what it's become. And it yeah, and the guys at the top are very greedy, and uh, yeah. They yeah, it, it was never for profit, okay? And so when you went to them, they were giving you the best care possible, you know? And uh, I, uh, uh, everybody raved about Kaiser. Today, everybody, you know, you're well, you're mortal line that you used on my show when you were doing a <laughs> commercial for them that lost us. A, it lost Kaiser as an advertiser. You referred to them as doctor-assisted suicide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, the story I've heard is that. Uh, uh, Kaiser talked to Nixon found out about Kaiser and he was all ready to go in and we would have had Medicare for all in the mid 70s and uh, apparently Ted Kennedy actually balked at it because he wanted his name on the bill and that didn't happen because of that Wow Wow well you know, we need it here in this country I, I don't I don't see why you get sick you know your hernia is hurting you like hell you can't go to a hospital and then when you leave there's no bill you know yeah or the fact that anybody would go into bankruptcy because of a medical problem is just ridiculous well that's one of the number one reasons for bankruptcy in this yeah. country oh. 
I mean, uh, you know, I mean, um, I pay, well, my wife's job because she still get, they still pay for her uh, health insurance, pays like 320 bucks a month per person, one for mm -hmm. my wife and I separately, um, to get supplemental insurance to the Medicare. So, you know, when you think that I'm not paying anything, I'm paying a lot for medical, because also uh, Medicare takes out, uh, what is it, uh, almost $200 a month. I think 170 out of your Social Security. 170 yeah. out of my Social Security, so my 170 so you're up to now. plus the 320, that's $500 a month. That's $5,000, $6,000 a year. Well, I mean, come on. Most people can't afford that. And people, when they get sick, should be taken care of. And you say, well, there are ways they could do it. Not really. Not to get the best care possible. I mean, when I had my prostate cancer, I got the best care possible. There was no question about the kind of care I was getting. And I went to the best doctors, and they took care of it. And so far, I'm, I'm cancer-free. And I'm now, what, three years into this thing now. So, you know, I mean, everybody should get that kind of care. Not just me, because I can afford it. Not just you, because you can't afford it. <laughs> you know? I mean, could you afford, how much could you afford for a medical procedure? I mean, could you, could you afford a lot, like how much do you pay Kaiser a year? Kaiser is, uh, with the Medicare Advantage, is $70 a month. $70 a month? Uh -huh. And the oh, hernia operation is two hundred dollars. Uh, it what copay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You have advantage. I don't. I, I don't have advantage. I have supplemental. It's much more expensive. But when I walk out of a, a, a medical situation like a hospital or my doctor or whatever, I don't pay a penny. Don't no, pay you a can penny. pretty much go anywhere. I'm stuck with Kaiser. Well, you go anywhere, and and also the, the best part about it is that you uh, don't owe co-pays and things like that. It's all taken care of by the mm -hmm. insurance. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy with it, but God knows, you know, it's expensive. It's just expensive. But it's the one thing I gotta make sure that I have the ability to, to do. I used to have a great plan with my union, AFTRA, SAG-AFTRA, but they did away with it. That's yeah. what I heard. It was great, and then they just did away with it like the past couple of years, right? Yeah. I mean, there were people in the union like Olivia de Havilland died at, I think, 105. And when they announced that Olivia de Havilland, she was in Gone with the Wind, folks, in case you're too young to remember. Uh, Olivia de Havilland uh, died at 105. I said, uh, well, there's another person going who didn't have health insurance. <laughs> you know, because there were all these people uh, there was Norman Lloyd who was uh, worked with Hitchcock for years as a producer on his TV shows and was, if you remember, Saboteur. He was the guy that fell from the Statue of Liberty in Saboteur. Right, yeah. And he died at 104, I think. And I again said, well, another guy didn't have life insurance. You know, these people were being affected by that plan. You know. Oh, I have a message. Uh, hi, it's David from Spectrum Financial. Anyway, uh, <laughs> better did, take that. <laughs> where, did, uh, where did that come from? I didn't tell it to. He, I, this computer keeps doing things that I don't tell it to do. Ding, you know. I'm speaking to. I'm speaking to my good friend, um, uh, but Larry Bubbles Brown. Please, don't do that. Anyway, so uh, so uh, any you playing anywhere? I'm at the Throgmorton Theater tonight. Yes. Oh, tonight. Well, that. But this is after the fact. So after the fact. Nobody I, knows I, that. How, how often? How often do you do the Throckmorton? Uh, about every couple of months. Yeah. And who's running great it? Great little. Who's running? And Lucy Mercer still owns it and runs it. She's great. And. Uh, yeah, but who started that whole comedy thing? It was what's his name, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Pitta. Mark Pitta, yeah. Yeah, who's now moved to L.A., or Vegas, from Vegas. Is, Ve is he in Vegas? I thought mm -hmm. he was in, like, Dallas or someplace like that. He moved to Atlanta briefly for the wife, and then uh, that ended. And 
Oh, yeah. So he wound up going back to, he went to uh, Vegas. Oh, yeah, he had that trophy wife, right? Yeah. yeah. She looked like a moose. No. <laughs> it looked like a moose. <laughs> That's an old joke of mine. I'll have a trophy wife. She looks like a moose. It looked like a moose. Hey, well, they're starting to hammer here. I don't know <laughs> if people can hear it yet, but. Well, that was good timing. We got, got yeah, to in just yeah. under the bell. Yeah. 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 Uh, I wish they'd start drilling and we could leave with that as kind of a theme song. But, uh, boy, they've been working on this building forever. And the dust. Yeah, you said they're cleaning between the bricks. That's gonna. That's like uh, dental cleaning. That's going to be forever. Yeah, also, health-wise, it can't be good. But anyway, hey, listen, Larry, good talking to you again, my friend. As always, Always a pleasure, and we'll talk to you again next week. Ladies and gentlemen. You got it. Larry Bubbles Brown is not playing at the Throck, Throckmorton. I can't talk anymore. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Well, thank you very much uh, to the wonderful and uh, delicious Larry Bubbles Brown. Always nice talking to him. And uh, we'll have him on again next week. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, waiting for people to call now. And uh, they are. Some of them are. Uh, let, me, let me admit them, and I'm going to tell you what I've been doing here for the last half hour. A little bit of the last half hour. Hi, Josh. How are you? Kevin, hi. How are you? Usually we all get together on Saturday, but here we are now. Gosh, this is great. Wait a minute. Let me turn your mic on. There we go. Hello there. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello. Can yep. you hear me? Over. Y yep. Can I hear you. And in uh, right now. There's Vernon Nunn. Hi, Vernon. How are you doing? Wiggly lines and everything. Yeah. Well, let me see here. I got to uh, hold on a second. I'm going to do this, and I but I'm going to slow but for the time being for a second. I'm, and I'll tell you why in a second. I'm going to put on the uh, animated uh, thing here for a second to make sure this is who it really is. Um, is that you, Jeff? Is that you, Jeff? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, it's um, it's Jeff Stein. Okay. Uh, uh, and then it says Wayne entered. Wayne, I'm sorry, Wayne. Go away. Okay. Bye bye. See you later. Don't need to talk to you. Uh, these guys have been calling me with all these different names before I ever, you know, while I was playing Bubbles. So I figured I'd have fun with them. Uh, so I answered the phone, and of course I then started getting videos of black guys with huge penises uh, <laughs> doing all matter of things, and I just let them go. And then I like give, give them the finger because they could see me, right? <laughs> and then I write, like I change, rename their name like I'm a shithead and mm -hmm. things like that. And then I, I just played with them for a while, and then I got rid of them, and that was it. You know, uh, we're wise to you guys, okay? So it doesn't matter. And if worse comes to worse, I just put this up and then we answer the phone. And if it's, and one of them said, by the way, that he was Jeff Stein. Oh, yeah. So that's why I was a little reticent to answer the one that said Jeff Stein because, you know, they might have done that. But, uh, you know, one, one time somebody actually put up Alex and thought I would answer it. You know, I mean, uh, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Anyway, so how are all you guys tonight? All right. Well, that sounds exciting. Tired from a long road trip. Oh, yeah. You were down in, uh, in Arizona? Yeah. Golden Valley, Mesa. What, what were you doing down there? Then uh, over to L.A. for two days. And uh huh. Well, why, well, you went there for the skiing, did you? Pardon? Did you go there for the skiing? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get out of there before the skiing started. Yeah. The yeah. They, they had a snowstorm in L.A. They still do. Yeah, yeah. Tell well, me tell well, me there I'm isn't something. The beat is still closed. Tell, tell me there isn't something wrong with our nature, okay? Oh, the, the media down in L.A. was like the world was falling apart. The sky was falling. Well. And, you know, there's this much snow on the ground. And you know something? Kids would, I bet kids loved it. You know? Oh, yeah. 
Oh my we're getting God. a lot. Um, I mean, we're I was, not getting a lot, but we're getting it in the Bay Area here, I, too. I, I was a kid that when I grew up, I didn't see snow much, uh, but then my father would play Lake Tahoe sometime during the winter, or Reno during the winter, and we would go up to Mount Rose, and there was snow up there. But, you yeah, know, that's I, what we got to do. But I was never, I never grew up in a snow area. So I remember the day when uh, snow came up, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it suddenly it snowed in Marin County. And boy, were we happy. Oh, God. That was like back in uh, 1964 when it hit us and, the you know, down below San Francisco. I remember there was one snowstorm. It may have been around then where it was snowing. At the beach, at the Cliff House. Yeah, yeah. Probably '64. Yeah, because this was in Burlingame. Yeah. Well, the one, the, the times that I remember, a couple of times when it would snow, uh, I was in, I was still in my teenage years. You know, I was a young whippersnapper, snapping. Yeah, whips. I wasn't even thought of by then. Yeah. You? Oh, really? Okay. Just put that on me, okay? <laughs> just. Uh, was this daddy's little drip. Daddy's little drip. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. I wasn't that far behind. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, let's see here. Anything? Well, uh, I I went to the do that doctor finally. And I got to tell you something. This is this is hilarious, really. I mean, it was, it's hilarious if you didn't have to go through it, okay? Uh, and it's nothing that they planned on doing to me. Now I have a problem where you can't find a vein very easily on me. I probably should drink lots of water before I go in for one of these things. As they, they say that helps, okay? But I didn't drink lots of water. So this place is called something like the Cancer and Blood, or Blood and Cancer whatever, okay? And it's this huge, it's this huge practice. I mean, it, it, incredible. I was amazed at the size of it. So very professional. All they ever do is deal with blood and deal with cancer. Okay? So you would think that they would be experts at drawing blood. Instead, she goes for my vein, which it's like here, and uh, she thinks she's found one. Okay? So she sticks the needle in. Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm used to needles. You know, I, when I went in for that whole thing where I had the, uh, the kidney stones, the God, they'd be poking me every hour on the hour. So I got used to it, all right? So she does it, and she can't get any blood to come out. It's like it's, it's dripping like it's maple syrup coming out of a tree, you know? I mean, nothing. So then I said, well, look, why don't you go for my, my hand here? Because what I have, and you notice I already have a bruise there? See that? I said, just just right there, you, you got a lot of veins there, and I'm very easy to go through my hands, all right? And I don't mind it. Go ahead, do it, okay? So she tries it. She can't find a vein. She's poking around like crazy, and now I have a black and blue mark there if you can see it, all right? Finally, they go over to this arm, all right? And they do this one. Oh, look, the black and blue mark is starting up, Okay? So that's, uh, that was that. They finally got blood out of there. But this is a place called the Cancer and Blood Institute or Infirmary or I don't know what it's called. But I mean, if you've got blood in your name, you gotta assume they're experts at it, right? Well, you know, they, they do have rookies there and sometimes they only let you try it twice, and then they'll call in a, an advanced phlebotomist. Oh, believe me, they brought in two other people uh -huh. who were having trouble doing it. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going, geez, almighty. You know, this is, it got to a point where it was really funny, okay? It was yeah. just hilarious. So they draw the blood, you know, and then they go and they do my, <laughs> my, my urine, they do my urine, and, uh, Whatever, and they'll they'll come back on the urine and say you've got blood in your urine. I've had blood in my urine for twenty years now, just a trace, right? And my urologist figured it out. He looked at it under a microscope and said there isn't any blood there. It's just a dipstick, because you know they don't see it. It's a dipstick, and the dipstick reacts to my urine or something and says there's blood in there. But he looked at it under a microscope and there's no blood. All right, so. 
So these guys will probably come back to me saying, well, you know, nothing was really wrong with your blood work, but, but my platelet count is low. It's like down around 79 or something like that. So we're going to have to do something about the platelets. And they're beginning to, th there was a, sl the guy said, look, you're going to live a long time. There's nothing here that's going to be terrible, okay? But we got to find out why your blood is reacting to what seems to be an infection somewhere in your body. Hmm. So we got to deal with that and figure out what it is. He said, so he came to the right place. I said, what, to get hmm. stuck in the arm with a needle? Hmm. You know, but, uh, uh, but so, you know, um, that was that was my day at the at the doctor's and he told me he said don't he says we'll get back to you we'll do all the blood work and so on and so forth and i said I, he he didn't think like the thing that i was sent over in the first place was anything he said ah that's nothing it was on the low side of of being high okay and uh, but i it, it need, needless to say you know me i w i was a wreck for the last week waiting for this appointment but uh, I didn't, I, you know what it is? I go to a urologist and, and the first thing you do when you go in there, they hand you a cup. They say, pee in it. Leave it on the, leave it on the uh, toilet uh, tank, right? Yeah. It's got your name on it. Put it in the little window. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, then I go to this guy and they draw my blood and my urine. All these guys ever do, they're out to get all your bodily fluids. <laughs> you know, it's their pastime. Hey, let's see how much blood we can get out of Bennett today. Oh, and by the way, they did like six bottles of blood <laughs> because they had to test for a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, I, I imagine they'll come back with something horrible because you can't do that much work up on me without finding something that's bad, you know, so. Anyway, I, it, it looks like he, he said to me, he said, don't worry, he said. And I said, well, do you think I'll have to have a biopsy? And this was interesting because they do a bone marrow biopsy. And this is like something out of the Middle Ages, too, you know. Um, and I said, well, I have to have a, do you think I'll have to have a biopsy? And he said, well, we'll get to that when we get to it. He said, oh, and by the way, we don't drill into you anymore for biopsies. We can do it all with blood tests to find out if you have you know, a problem with your bone marrow. So uh, I, I, he made me feel better about it all. And he said, don't worry, you're going to live a long life still. He said, there, there's, there, there may be something here, but it's nothing dangerous or serious. So, well, so he said, I said, I promise you, blah, 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 blah. I said, really? Because doctors don't ever promise anything. So. No, they just get you worked up and take your money. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, $100 I $100 handshake. The only thing that bothers me, I walk into this place and it's gigantic. And he's got, I, he's got to have at least 30 people working there, you know? And it's a big piece of real estate in a building on the bottom floor. And you think to yourself, they got to make a lot of money here in order to pay for all of this. And I'm thinking, how are they going to make that money? Oh, let's do this to Bennett. Let's do that to Bennett, and so on. You know, I'm getting a little slap back here for some reason. I don't know. Six hundred bucks, eight hundred bucks a vial for those tests. You know, they took six of them from you. You know, and they'll charge the insurance company about six or seven thousand dollars a vial. Yeah. <laughs> well, all I know is, I mean, these guys. I mean, they've got a big tab. They really do. Yeah. So has anybody been watching this stupid trial? I watched part of it today, yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. Like Gomer Pyle on, no, uh, on oh, trial. Oh, yeah, but, but, yeah, right. <laughs> you're right. Uh, but uh, you just sit there and you watch. I'm watching this thing and I'm going, why is this even on? What is the possible sociological significance and political significance uh, or, or anything that's going to affect our lives? You know? No, no they, won't, they won't conduct a great hearing in Washington, D.C. on, uh, well, I don't know, something that they don't think is 
particularly popular, but they'll go to this thing and spend all day with this guy on the stand because it's morbid curiosity. Good. You know? And I'm getting a little sick of that. You know? So. It's pretty much what it was. Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, Vernon? Oh, I'm doing fine. I had my annual physical this week, too. You have your annual physical? Yep. The only thing that was on the outside the norm was my white blood cell. So is mine. So is mine. It could be you've got some kind of an infection, or maybe you had an infection. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I thought, but he, he didn't seem concerned about it at all. Well, this guy didn't seem that concerned about it. He said, your white blood cell is outside the norm, but just up a little, you know. So he said, that, that, that doesn't bother me. He says, the platelets, we, we'll give you some stuff, and it'll help, you know, build them up again. Mine, uh, mine was uh, just below the, the normal. You know, I'm above. I'm above the normal. But I'm below. Oh, I'm, my, my blood, uh, my, uh, what do you call it, my... Uh, platelets really dropped significantly so there's something going on there but he said we'll find out what it is and you came to the right place to get it I said yes because you're the blood and cancer place right uh, I he was he was he did the uh, he did the thing where he goes you know goes under here feels my glands feels my armpits I said is everything okay there he says yeah I'm not feeling a thing and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I wish I was better than that. You know. uh, he said, yeah, everybody says that. Uh, and then uh, he got down to my groin and he found an enlarged lymph node. He said, but, you know, one lymph node, it's no big deal. So They think, you know what they think it might be? This will interest you, Vernon, since you went through it. They said it might be the radiation I had. That the radiation can affect lymph nodes and, the lymph node. yeah yeah and and affect the white blood cells and so on and he said oh you you had a you had all that i said yeah I had the radiation and the seeds and he said well i could do it you know well my, my uh, radiation was 11 years ago then. yeah yeah but you're younger than i am and mine was only th mine was only three years ago you know I mean, it doesn't mean I've got cancer or whatever from the radiation. It just means that the radiation affected my, my white blood cells and so on. So, but enough of my medical workup, you know. But I just thought you'd find it hilarious this whole thing with how many times I got stabbed today, and then then afterwards they apologized. Oh, we're sorry, you know. Uh, and I said, yeah, but I'm thinking to myself, you guys you must do this. 50 times a day. Everybody that walks in the door there gets blood drawn. It's just, you know, first let's see your blood, now go see the doctor. And um, so I, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'm going, how can they be this bad at it? You know, so. And, and, the, and I say, there were three people. Each one gave it a try. So these were all guys, people who do it all day long. Now, now, I went to another place to get my blood taken a couple of weeks ago. No problem finding a vein. No problem. So I just said, go through the hand. They went through the hand. Look at this thing. That's getting good. That's going to be great. By by Monday, I'll I'll have a real thing. Yeah, they there. do say that drinking water will pop up your veins a little bit. And they're easier yeah, that's get. what they said to do. Yeah. 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 So um, anyway, so don't, nobody's trying to call in now, these people. You, you warded them all off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it was fun to be able to give them the finger and do everything because <laughs> I was playing bubbles. I uh, had that on the air and off the air. I was having fun with uh, all these idiots that were trying to call, including Jeff Stein. Mm -hmm. There you go. You should sue them for impersonating you, Jeff. Is this the second? Hmm? Is it just two? I don't know. I don't... Jeff Steins or are they three? No, no it's one Jeff Stein. And about three other, four other people who are probably only, I think there are only about two people that are doing this. And it might only be one that's just calling over and over and over again. Um, but uh, the th trouble is the porn is really bad porn. It's not, even if I were <laughs> gay, it's bad porn. 
You know, it's usually guys, mm -hmm. you know, which is, uh, uh, but it, 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 at least, you know, I was hoping I would see something decent, you know, and that while Bubs was on, I could masturbate, but, you know, it was impossible, so. At least click the recording, right? Uh, oh, here comes Brian Neary. You ever heard of this guy? Mm. Yeah, he's the one that was, um, mm -hmm. Jeff Stein, I think. Was it was was Brian Neary? I think it was Brian that was doing it. No, you were. He wasn't doing Jeff. Yeah, stuff. he was. He was. He was impersonating Jeff. Yeah, but then how come he put up porn videos? Yeah, because that's what he does. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, hi, Brian. Oh, hi, Brian. Who are we talking about? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I'll have some of my, some of my soda. Here. I saw what I saw his. Uh, his video that he had to explain to his daughter today about the kissing squirrels. <laughs> What's this? Wait a minute, tell me. I don't understand. Uh, two squirrels were getting it on, and Adrian said, Daddy, look at the two squirrels. Yeah. And and this was a video she found, like, on TikTok or something? No, she goes, I'm going to take a picture. So she took a picture of the two squirrels, one's on top of the other one. And the ones are, like, I don't know, like, biting at it or something, and she says, why is the one on top biting? I said, maybe they're wrestling or they're giving a massage or something. I don't know. You know something? It, it was, there's always a time There's always a time oh, in this boy. world where fathers had the unenviable duty of speaking to their children, and mothers too, about the ways of the world, right, at some point in their life. By the time you get around to it, they will have known it for years yeah. and just never told you, you know? Yeah, I, re I remember my 21st birthday, and my grandfather, who I love, was my hero, brought me to the restaurant that he goes to all the time with the bar and everything. And says, I'm going to get you your first drink. And he told the people who work there that he knows, I'm getting Brian his first drink. And they all looked at him and they said, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when I, was, mm -hmm. when I was a kid and I was growing up, I think I, I can't remember when my father told me but he took me down to the bedroom. I think I was only like about 16. In those days, kids didn't know much till they were 16, 17, whatever, you know. Today, kids are getting laid at 14, right? You know, I, I, I didn't get have sex for the first time till I was 19. I made up for it, but you know. In Kentucky, it's not even illegal unless you're younger than 13. Yeah, right. Right. And cousins. Yeah, yeah. and co cousins are okay, though, see, because you're related. And that, uh, that's... anyway, so so um, my father takes me down to the bedroom and he says, well, son, I got I to gotta tell you something. And he says, I got to tell you about the, how, how, how you came to be and how things work. He said, uh, you may not be ready for it yet. You may not be interested in it yet, but let me tell you. And he told me, how a man and a woman procreate. And my father was quite the joker. Very funny man. I get my humor from him. Okay? Very funny man. Much funnier than I am. And he told me this story, and after he told it to me, I burst out laughing. I figured he was putting me on. What, you take this thing and you put it in a woman? And then I'm thinking, he says, no, this is for real. I'm telling you the truth. This is no joke. And I thought for a second, and the first thought that came to mind was, ooh, that's disgusting. A few years later, it wasn't disgusting anymore. It just kind of like something, you know, <clears throat> a light bulb goes on, you know. I said that Adrian was clock blocking the squirrel because she ran out there and scared him away. <laughs> oh, this was actually happening in, outside your house? Yeah. yeah, right out. Oh, oh, oh. Right oh. Right oh. Daddy, look, the two squirrels. <laughs> she see, was... I, see, I can I can relate to that because I, I have girls too, and I had to deal with that crap too. For many years. Wow. And they would see this stuff on National Geographic, you know, a couple <laughs> monkeys humping or some other shit. And you gotta yeah. go, what are they doing? Oh no, nothing. They're doing they're just they're playing in the in the jungle, you know, shit like that. Yeah. <clears throat> And he just ran into the same thing. Yeah. It was kind of funny. Yeah. yeah they're, they're kissing. She goes, ew. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you, she, she, did she say they were, the did she say they were, other. did she say they were kissing? 
I said they were kissing. Oh, you said they were kissing. <laughs> yeah, oh, she said they were typical little girl thing and said ew. I wouldn't yeah. say I wouldn't say anything because you know you want the trust of your children, and when they grow up and find out you were lying to them that they weren't kissing. Yeah, but anything you can put on Facebook for a laugh is worth it for me. Yeah, yeah exactly. But all I'm saying is, I don't think kids are growing up today having to wait that long to find out about the ways of the world, you know, yeah. because it's being, it's there all the time. You know? Nope. It's, yeah, they know by seventh grade how to do it. I mean, my, when I was growing up, my father I, had a theory, and, and so did my mother, of course, because she agreed with everything my father said. That was a good time for men, okay? Uh, but she, um, uh, he just said that he believed, see, I asked him some question or something that prompted him to tell me, all right? Like, Daddy, where did I come from? Or, you know, uh, and, um, well, you came out of your mother's vagina. Ugh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Uh, That's even ooh for you when you're the husband too. Jeez. Yeah, right. But the thing is that that he said that he believed that you wait you you wait until your kid asks the question, mm. then they're ready to get the answer. You don't sit them down before that and tell them something yeah, that you don't bring it up. They're not ready for, and they will bring it up at the proper time. You know, they're not going to go thirty four yeah, years. No. I mean, <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't get any questions, and and we finally got the letter from the school mm -hmm. at I think it was seventh or eighth grade is when they send home the letter, and they say we're going to do this, and it's usually the last week of school, just before summer. Mm -hmm. And you get the letter, and they say if you don't want your kid there, mm -hmm. don't bring them to school this day or these two days, and then this is happy humping day. Yeah, <laughs> and then they send them send them home for the summer, and you gotta go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was, uh, it, and I I remember my father telling me. I remember boys, me just boys, breaking. It's not so bad, but it's the girls. Well, that are boy, a uh, boy, it's easier. A uh, boy, it's easier. Well, now, now let me ask you this, Brian. Uh, Brian. Uh, are you going to let your wife talk to Adrian? Or are you going to do it? Oh, yeah, yeah. She talks to the girls. I talked to Simon already. Yeah. I told him, like, straight up. Yeah, yeah. And, and did he laugh? Don't la trust the girls, I did say. Did he, <laughs> did, he la did he laugh when you told him? I said, enjoy your life. Well, you know, I had Adrian when I was 48. I said, you want to see, you want to know all the stories I have having fun and not being serious with anybody and not getting into trouble like that? You know, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and so she will tell, she tells the girls. Yeah. Yeah, because it would be impossible for you to do it. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. I don't want that job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. But it, it, yeah. So. But I still tell them, but you know what? <clears throat> but so we, they were five and seven, Simon and Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And, but I talked to them a lot, like every couple of years about, you know, no one should touch you, you know, in your, in your private spots, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I said, even if it's family, even if it's me, you tell your mom. Even if it's somebody that says, if you tell your mom, I will kill you and I'll kill everybody, they will not be able to do that, you know? So you always tell them, I keep telling them that. And I told Adrian like the first time a couple months ago. But, you know, I tell them that stuff because, you know, that 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 kind of stuff will ruin, you know, kids' life. Well, there's a difference between abuse and, and yeah. yeah. That kind of well, what you're doing is you're protecting your kid. Yeah, when you're and doing sorry, that, and you know, Adrian's only seven, but still, you know, you never know what happened at you know, school or wherever. So, yeah, they got to know there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. So, so and that's and, easy, basic stuff, you know, the just the private parts. So. And in your in your family, Kevin, uh, did your wife told the girls? Well, I did, and my wife did because we were separated, but we did it from different different oh. angles on my younger kids. Oh, I see, the but older kids, it, yeah. And, now with my present kid, it's been a team effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, that's good, you know. And you don't have any kids, Josh, so you can't get in on this discussion just like I can't get in on this discussion. 
What did you do, Jeff? Did you tell your uh, Did you tell your girls or? I can't remember. <laughs> they, they told him. So long ago. It must have been pre-stroke. I tell you. <laughs> I, I mean, I tell my daughter now from from a man's side. I tell them that men are assholes. Stay away from them. I tell them don't trust the guy because they're thinking with one thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, what did it say? It started streaming. What? Is... Oh, I see. Okay, I see. I know. I don't remember that being a. I don't know, twelve-year-old or something. Mm-hmm. I knew everything at that time. And your parents didn't even tell you. Yeah, but it's better if your parents tell you than you find it out in the schoolyard because schoolyard it's a lot of rumors too, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you're lucky, the kid comes back from the schoolyard and says, "Daddy, what's this about?" And then you can initiate go into the conversation. So that may be the positive part about having it in the schoolyard. How about how about you, Vernon? You Most have... part they tell you they tell you I already know that shit. That's yeah. What they do. Yeah. I already know it. Okay, what do you know about it? And then you turn around and say, okay, well, this is how you should approach it. Well, I had a friend of mine in Houston, Texas, who told me the story about, and this was about his father coming to visit him. And he said, Dad, I got to tell you something. I do marijuana. Now, in those days, that was, you know, hep smoke a reefer reefer kind of days, you know. So he he said, uh, I I smoke pot, and it would do me a, a lot of good if you would try it with me, mm-hmm. just so I can kind of show you what I enjoy, okay? And his father said, okay, you know, I'm I'm game. So they both sit down. The kid rolls a joint, and he uh, he then uh, lights it up, inhales, you know. And then, of course, the most famous word in pot smoking is ear. Yeah. Ear. And he said, now, Dad, all you have to do is just, you know, suck on it and bring it into your lungs and then hold it for a little bit and then let it out. Okay? And so they both pass the joint back and forth, and the father's doing it, the kid's doing it, the father's doing it. And finally, the kid says, well, Dad... What do you, are you getting high? He says, yeah. He says, what do you think? He says, hasn't changed since I was a kid. <laughs> and that's really, you know, I mean, any any of us who think the kids aren't, especially today, quite street wise about all of this stuff, you know, and everything they want to just make sure that you tell them about sex so they get it from the right source. And, and, you know, the school is probably the best place to, for them to really learn the ins and outs, so to speak, of it, because uh, uh, they have a curriculum and they, they follow it, you know. But you should tell them, too, because you should have the, you should have the privilege, you know. My, 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 remember, I told you my, my mom passed away when I was 13, so my dad was always at his girlfriend's, and I'd go through, I found his marijuana stash, and then, but then I found his porno stash. So I learned from like a couple movies like Winnie Bango mm-hmm. and, and you know those type of things. That's how I learned about sex. Winnie, Winnie Bango. Winnie Bango was one I remember. So yeah. Debbie does Dallas was always the one you find. You know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but uh, Vernon, you have kids, don't you? I have two adopted biracial kids, so my son's the oldest of the two, and. We had to have the talk. Yeah. That most black families have to have with their son. <clears throat> oh, that talk. The one that about don't, exactly. don't don't get sassy with a cop. Just say yes exactly. or no, sir. Hmm. Yeah. He got stopped one time. I forget he was at a friend's house or something. And he was stopped by a police car in our neighborhood. And they wanted to know what the hell he was doing in this neighborhood. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, well, you know, that, it's interesting that you as a white guy had to have that talk because most, most black parents know how to do it, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Vernon, how, how old were they when you adopted them? Uh, she was five months and she was two months. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. so, I mean, they were literally your kids. Really? I mean, yeah. you know, 
wasn't like foster children or anything like that. You know. Well, uh, he was in a foster family for the first four months of his life, and then we adopted him through Catholic charity. So. Oh, good. Very good. God, bravo for you. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, we we, we feel blessed that, that we were able to get them when we did because we lost two trying to have our own. Mm. Yeah, I... Um, um, you know, I just, um, we, neither Marjorie or I have had kids, but we have thought about adopting so we'd have somebody around the house who could clean. You know, so. <laughs> that doesn't work when they're a teenager. <laughs> that doesn't work. Do you think you're on track and then one day they turn on you? Yeah. Yeah. They pull out the CP card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how you doing, Josh? What's new with you? Doing, doing, doing well. Nothing new, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, status quo. Uh, now, you, now you live in what state again? I live in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And you did? Was it? It was Ohio where they had that big train thing, right? Yeah. Palestine. Oh uh, yeah, it's up. Yeah, it's northeast of here, but yeah. Yeah, and you had Trump go there because he thought it was in Israel. Uh, but and yeah. fortunately, it's it's in Ohio, and he brought Not Trump. Not really sure he, why he visited, but yeah. And, and he brought done, yeah. he brought Trump water, hey, you know, and he made he made sure you knew it was Trump water. We didn't yeah. just bring water; we brought right. Trump water. Well, I'm sure everyone feels a lot better now. There are probably a lot of people up there voted for him, so. Uh, maybe they're well, comforted by that. I'm not sure. Everybody. Uh, Everybody has been downing our president because he didn't go there, and I and never and Buttigieg and, Bud yeah, and yeah, Buttigieg. That's... But the thing is that I've never seen what having people like the president go there is good for. It's a nuisance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all the people, never... all the people that he's got to that, that have to stop doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the police and the fire and everybody else mm -hmm. have to stop with doing what they're doing to protect whoever's going to take their picture. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it, I, I know from personal experience that uh, when we had an earthquake in the in, in, the, in North Beach, uh, a, a quail came by, you know. Yeah, and I, so all the traffic stops for them and there are police following them and all of all that. And you go on the peninsula. You know. Yeah, we we were there. I saw him when he was up Yeah, there. I did too. I was driving a truck and I had to sit on an off ramp for 15, 30 minutes or some yeah. shit. Well, he drove by and waved to everybody. Well, I was so proud, though. See, I was really proud because I was standing there as Quail's car went by. Okay. And as his car turned the corner, somebody screamed out, Hey, look, there's Alex Bennett. <laughs> I mean, we, we really, we, we felt his coming to see us was an intrusion. And not because we didn't like Dan Quayle, but because it was an intrusion. That we're, we're yeah. in rubble, you know, don't come. And they and, don't do anything. They just stand there and say, oh, this is terrible, and they drive away. It's just a photo op. So I really praise Biden for not going out there. You know, and because Trump I, I, used to, you know, in, in Trump's defense, he never used to go either. So who cares? Well, Buttigieg, though, went a few days ago, and Definitely. some people were like giving him a bad time or something. Why didn't you come sooner? Well, to begin with, Buttigieg is in Washington trying to get things done to solve this problem, not go out there to just be a looky-loo and, and do a, a, you know. And I saw him say that in an interview. He said, I don't want to go out there for a photo op. Let everybody else go out there for their photo ops. I'm here trying to get stuff done. And, you know, yeah, and then he the, finally sub, you know, said, I'm going to go there in a few days, but I'm not going there now. Well, they were giving him a bad, going, bad time when he was there. And finally he said, listen, he said, I know that you're very, you're, you're so happy that Donald Trump came out here. I mean, I was amazed he said this. You're so happy Donald Trump came out, this, out here, but realize that this problem <clears throat> that happened with this train was created by Donald Trump exactly. because he, uh, what, signed a bill to not put any pressure oh. on the uh some something he signed it was the regulation on the brakes on the brakes right. yeah right. so the i what what alan was saying the other night was 
it's everyone was supposed to before i guess uh maybe obama had something in place that everyone had to upgrade their brake system whether it's hydraulic yeah. or something and then uh, that that one company was like one of the last companies to do it and then trump came in and and said no you don't have you know they took that law away and so they, they didn't have the regulation yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think people are upset because it seems like there was no action taken from the president's group, you know? Yeah. And, and even if Buttigieg said that yeah. stuff, it, there wasn't stuff up front. But yeah, Quail was like a big distraction. My friend and I went up there after the earthquake, cruise around like spectators. <laughs> and, uh, and where he was, you know, walking around, I mean, just huge mobs, you know, going everywhere. And it's really, really distracting. And somebody we said were, that Trump didn't cool. have to go up there, but he, he could have sent the water. You know, he didn't have to go up there with the water. And all it was doing was it was slowing people down and it was causing problems, you know. Did you notice that he looks a little bit older? Who? Trump. Oh, Trump? Trump, yeah, the stuff that I saw, he looks a little burnt out. Uh, I, I think he, you know, his craziness is catching up with him. One you know. can only hope. Well... <laughs> Yeah, but there's still people that are going to vote for him, you know? There's still people who think he's a good time, and I, f I find that amazing. Because I would think that if nothing more, even if you were a Trump supporter, you'd be sick and tired of him by now, yes. you know? Like, enough drama. Let's get on to other stuff. And I don't think, I don't think he's going to win the nomination, but who knows, you know? Today, Pence said he, he hoped he wouldn't run. Because he said he, we don't need that kind of, what was the word he put? How did he put it? That that kind of distraction in this country, that Trump brings with him. Uh, and you hear what he's he, trying to do with the special prosecutor? No. He's trying to say that he was acting in his legislative role, and therefore should not have to testify about January six because separation of powers. He was the president of the Senate when he was doing his thing, and that 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 should exclude him from testifying. Oh, oh you mean it, uh, Pence says he doesn't have to? Right. Yeah. He's uh, trying to ignore the subpoena uh, that mm. Jack Smith has issued for him. I don't know why he why he wants to uh, avoid the subpoena because the fact of the matter is that nobody's blaming him for anything. I mean, hell, his life was in. Uh, in uh, uh, you know, in uh, in peril. Well, he he well, wants to have you. you know the best of both worlds. I mean, he he won't he's he won't criticize Trump or speak ill of him. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I heard some clips of him this morning that must have been from yesterday or something. Mm -hmm. And he still answers the questions about whether Trump should run or not with things like, well, I think we'll have better choices. I mean, he won't even say the, Trump's name. Right. You know, I, I mean, I, I haven't even heard him say Trump. I mean, Pence is one of the most, I, I don't care what happened on the 6th. He is one of the most chicken shit, fucking spineless people I've ever seen. Yep. I mean, Yep. Well, that Kevin guy McCarthy. has no integrity, no pride. I mean, Him and Kevin McCarthy. You know, they're all like that. I mean, look, the people in East Palestine. I guarantee you, I know that area. That was ninety-nine percent Trump voters who don't want the government, who hate the government, and now they got a problem, and now they're bitching because the government isn't there to help them. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because free market Norfolk Southern or CXS or whichever one it was isn't up there spending their billions to clean up their mess. Gee, imagine that. Now you want the government to make them? <laughs> yeah. Fuck them. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's that's their own doing. I mean, so, you know, that that's... That's the way it goes. I mean, uh, should they get cleaned up? Sure, I wouldn't have any problem if the government went in there and took over and cleaned it up. But they'd be the first one to, to bitch. Yep. So clean it up yourself then. I don't care. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, the way that they do it. But uh, yeah. these railroads in Ohio have taken over large portions. You know, they 
goes. I mean, that same well, group, Norfolk <laughs> Southern, built an intermodal. Yeah. Just a few miles up the road from me to attach to this this air base up here that you guys know I live close to. That's now a mm-hmm. commercial airport. And when they build it, you know, it's an intermodal, so obviously it has slow moving and stop trains. And mm-hmm. they were blocking traffic all the way back to the little village that we live in to the point that the EMS people were complaining because, you know, they couldn't get from one side of town to the other. The residents were complaining. And this went on for like three and a half or four years before they built an overpass up over the railroad tracks um, because the government couldn't find the money to build it. Yeah. Because after they let them build the intermodal and it fucked up traffic, the railroad, who got tax abatement to come there, refused to contribute any money to help build the road to solve the problem that their presence created. By the way, by the way, look who's here. Trucker Steve, ladies and gentlemen. And I hear, Steve, you got a kidney. Yep. Yep. When did you get the kidney? Uh, It will be two weeks tomorrow. Really? And how are you feeling? How are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. I still got one train bag still go. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully it'll be out by Monday. Yeah, but that's... I have to take a catheter or um, a stent mm-hmm. out on Monday too. Yeah, but I mean you're you're up and running now. That's good. Yeah. Do you it's feel all done? Do you feel um, better? Not, not quite pain, pain free yet, but well, you had a, you know they beat you up a little bit when they do that. Mm-hmm. How long did the operation take? I believe they said it took about four or five hours. That long? Did they do both of them? I still have my two original kidneys, and they put in the third one. Oh, really? Wow. Why do they do that? I don't understand. What You would think they would remove one and then replace it. No, well, and they went through. Uh, they could have gone through the back, but they went through the front for this one. Really? Okay. Yeah. So now Is you that have... because of rejection, they might because they might reject it. They got the other two still in there, or uh, yeah, I'm on any rejection drugs for the rest of my life. What about what about the two kidneys that you do have? Do they still work to a certain minor extent? Yeah, they, they were around ten percent for for being able to to work. Yeah. But once you once you are on your way and they fi- you finished healing and all of that, are you pretty much going to these going to last you the re- this one going to last you the rest of your life? Um, they said it could last maybe up to twelve to twenty years. Twelve to twenty years, then you have to find another one. It could last longer. Yeah. If I take you know, stick with my regimen. With my pills, I mean, what, what? I got everything scheduled on my phone. Like yeah. I set my alarms on my phone to take whatever. Yeah, I have to take my anti rejection every two, twelve hours. Okay, and I take a lot of pills too. Yeah, I mean, but do you have like to do that? Do you have to do that? In the morning. Yeah, and then I take anti rejection, two anti rejections at eight o'clock at night. But I mean, do you have to do that for the rest of your life? At, at that rate, or does it back off a little bit? Uh, some of the pills that I'm taking, one is pre- called Presidis, Pres- Presidizone? Pred- yeah. Yeah, it's Presidizone. It's a steroid, I yeah. guess. They started out with, uh, I had to take like nine pills a day, and now I'm down to four. Okay. And, right. Until they tell me to drop off a little bit more. Longer. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for you because you were waiting for that kidney and you finally got it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but how, how long did you wait? Uh, just a little more than a year and a half. So, Canada, you wait a year and a half, and in, in America, you can wait up to five, six, seven years. Wow. Well, my brother-in-law like was, my brother-in-law was four, I think it was four and a half, five years. But if you got but a lot of, if you got a lot, to take his daughter's kidney. If if you got a lot of money in this country, you can go to the front of the line or pay somebody for their kidney. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but that's what, always, that's what's different about Canada and U.S. What were you gonna say? What were you saying, Steve? 
it's not always that way here. I know um, when I was going to dialysis, there was a a guy who was uh, he was a double amputee because he had diabetes. Oh boy! And he um, decided he didn't want to go to dialysis anymore, and he was dead in three days because enough fluid had built up in his body that um, it pressed up against his heart and it stopped. Hmm. Wow. And he, he was just sick of waiting for a, for a kidney. But, uh, but you, you, so you, you're completely off dialysis. You don't, that you don't need that anymore. Nope. I'm done. Did they take the USB port out of you? <laughs> you know, uh, that was done. They took that out a week before I got the call. Oh, okay. I was literally finishing a, a run delivering auto parts to the Honda plant mm -hmm. in Alliston, Ontario. And I was 20 minutes from the yard when I got the call and they wanted me there uh, by 1030 a.m. Mm -hmm. And it was they called me at like 830. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had to rush to get to the yard, do my paperwork, drive the car home so I could park it at the house and get a neighbor to take me to the hospital yeah so i won't have to leave the car in the parking garage there at the hospital because it's expensive well you look healthy you know um i'm feeling much better yeah, yeah. wow i'll feel even better once they got this stupid uh drain bag off of me mm -hmm. yeah um yeah oh boy well and then to get the stain out they're gonna have to stick a catheter into my penis, which yeah. I had to carry one of those fucking things for four days after the surgery, and I, I couldn't sleep with that goddamn thing. Well, I, my... I had a catheter uh, once when I went in for my uh, for my uh, what do you call it? the the uh, seeds the uh, seeds in my prostate, and afterwards I had that attached to me until I was ready to go home. And then they yanked it out. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's not pleasant. No, it's, it's well, I just, I, that that was the part that just didn't make me feel great. But once it's in there, you don't, you know, you don't really notice it in there. I mean, Phil. Oh, I did mine. Huh? You did? I, Phil, yeah, Phil, when he was, had his. Every time I tried to sleep, I had to try and position myself where it wouldn't bother me. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. Phil had, there are several kinds of catheters. Uh, the one I had, I don't know, for some reason it, it stays in. I didn't feel it as a problem. I just felt that I couldn't leave the hospital until they took this thing out of me. It was like they were holding me hostage. Well, you can't go home yet. You know, you're, you're not ready to pee yet, whatever. And they keep this thing in you. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going home. And you drag this thing along with you, you know. But, uh, yeah, I I, ch I checked in on Friday morning. Mm -hmm. The surgery was on the Saturday. Yeah. Uh, they started at around what was it twelve o'clock? I think at ten, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> or no, I think it was eight. Yeah. Eight o'clock, and then I was done by twelve or one, and in my hospital room back by two once I'd woken up from the yeah. anesthesia you must and have... was watch, watching hockey for the rest of the day after that. Let me ask you this question, just because we were talking a little bit about medicine tonight in this country. How much did this whole procedure cost you? Zero. Thank you very much, folks. We can't do that here. We can't do that here. Oh, we have programs in place. You can get it if you want it. No, we don't have programs in place here. I mean, but that idea that you, you know, you had what has to be three, four hundred thousand dollar procedure, something like that, maybe more, and you didn't pay a penny for it. It's the way it should be, you know. It's the way it should be. How and the drugs that I got. Uh, thankfully for my wife's benefits at her work. Yeah, I mean, uh, is covered a hundred percent because they can yeah. cost up to twenty thousand a year. I mean, Jeff, uh, how much? How much did your uh, your uh, your heart implant cost? Hmm. 
I'm sure probably cost at that time $40,000 or something. Really, that's all? Yeah, but that's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And how much did you have to pay? <laughs> it wasn't zero. And insurance would take care of that. Yeah, what, but, but you know, you can't say, hey, I paid zero because I had insurance because you paid the insurance all that of time. <laughs> you know, I mean. Uh, I went to Australia one time and and I, I had to get some more medication. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do they do? He says, just go over to the hospital. They'll tell you what you need. Right, you were telling me that. I've had and people who went to England. To me, yeah. And I said, well, how do I pay for it? They go, no, we don't charge yeah. people. In England, I had somebody I knew who got sick there. And he said, uh, they said, do you just go to the hospital? And they took care of him. And when he left, he said, well, how much do I owe? And they said, it's on us, you know. Even if you're a guest in our country, we take right. care of you. You know, why can't we do that here? What is wrong with us? You know. My wife was on a trip with her mom to France and lost the crown. And they took care of it. The, went to a dentist in France and he took care of it with no cost. And not a penny. Nope. I went oh, to, when I was in, when I was in uh, France... Uh, I got a, I can't, I can't remember what it was, it was uh, a strep throat. And I, they, I went to the hospital, the local hospital there, and they couldn't see me because they said I was an American. But they suggested that I go into town and there were, was a private doctor there who would deal with it and give me, you know, all, all, all I needed were antibiotics, you know. Mm -hmm. But they made me go somewhere else because I wasn't, I wasn't French which every day I'm glad I'm not, but, you know, so. Well, anyway, let me see here. Well, ha Pam congratulations on a happy kidney, yeah. you know. Pam is, is planning to go on a vacation out of the United States. Yeah. But she has an eye problem, and she gets an injection like once a month. In her eye? Yeah, in her eye. <laughs> Yeah, this doesn't hurt. Well, no, because doesn't they put they put that they put that silver nitrate or something in there, and you don't your eyeball doesn't feel anything. Ugh. Well, anyway, she's just terrified to go to another country. Oh, you know what? When I had my uh, when I had my cataract thing, they put the, the the numbing stuff in your eyeball, and they cut into your eyeball. You don't feel it. You know, you feel absolutely nothing. You know. It's when like, I had my cataract, I went to a bunch of car shows. To a bunch of what? What is that? What is that? What is that? I can't see it. Well, I wanted to show it to you before I left because I remember uh, when I went down to LA this last couple days ago. Oh. I was looking. I we went to Hollywood Boulevard looking at the stars. Yeah. And I went specifically looking for Mr. Trump's star. Oh God! <laughs> it keeps getting. I ripped. figured. This one was all busted up, and they had cones around it. And I figured that was the one because everybody keeps beating up on it. They won't let it on. stay there. I think they. Huh? I think they finally decided, didn't they? At some point, that they weren't going to repair it. They just let it go to shreds. Yeah, I think this that wasn't it because I found out later it was down by the Chinese theater, and I didn't go down that far. But yeah, I figured this might have been it because it was all fucked up, and they were fixing it. <laughs> well, like, yeah, it could be. Yeah, so I took a picture of it, and they no, nah, they said it wasn't. <clears throat> but uh, yeah. I was looking for it. <laughs> you know, I could get a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yeah, you do Anybody that. Anybody can. You, yeah, you pay for it. Yeah. You pay yeah. for it. They, There's so many of them. There's doubles and triples of the goddamn things. I didn't realize. Oh, oh really? Such... Yeah, I but, saw, but you so know what it is? Two, that... two or three, not Mickey Rooney's, but somebody else. There was a couple of them. Well, uh, but you, if you look closely, one of them is for like... Uh, film, one of them's for one's television. For film, one's for records, yeah, one for yeah. broadcasting yeah. or whatever, yeah. Yeah. That's what I figured out was. Yeah. So if you get an EGOT, you probably got four of them there. Yeah. 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 They're, they're pretty cool to watch. I'd never been there before in my life, and I told my wife, let's just go down there and walk around. But you pay for them. You pay for them. That's oh, yeah. You, you pay for them. We never got down to the Chinese theater, but, you know, yeah. we... We saw a lot of bums, a lot of people offering free hits on dope and, and stuff and like a, that. And a know. lot of badly dressed Spider-Men. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, listen, thank you uh, for uh, talking to us this evening, uh, uh, Josh Wheeler. Wonderful. 
Uh, thank you, Kevin. Nice having you here. Vernon Nunn, always a pleasure to have you around. Uh, Jeff Stein, glad you called so many times tonight. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Brian. And finally, I can't tell you how happy we are for you, Trucker Steve. Well, I heard about your operation the other night from uh, Phil, who saw your posts online. And he told me about it, and I was just delighted when I found out. Everybody, yeah, gi are. give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. Okay? There they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Jack Bishop had a perfect show last night. I think we got his problems all fixed, and so he'll be next with the uh, intersection. I'll see you again on Monday with uh, the uh, pop-up show, and then we'll see you on uh next Wednesday, same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody, and have a nice weekend.